Good afternoon and welcome to the Middle East Forum's webinar and podcast series featuring talks from the Middle East Forum's various projects. My name is Winfield Myers. I'm the director of Campus Watch and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Today's format will be a 15 minute lecture followed by Q&A from myself and the audience. If you in the audience would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A box that is located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. I'm very pleased to introduce today's guest, who is Martin Kramer. Uh, Martin is the founding president of Shalem College in Jerusalem, where he now teaches modern Middle Eastern history. He taught at Tel Aviv University for 25 years after earning his BA and PhD in Middle Eastern history at Princeton University, where he studied under Bernard Lewis, among others. Today, we're going to discuss his 2001 book, Ivory Towers on Sand, The Failure of Middle Eastern Studies in America, which appeared about six weeks after 9-11 and was a landmark work in its critique of the academic field of Middle East studies. As I say, the first 15 minutes will be a lecture by Professor Kramer, and then we'll get to Q&A. So, uh, Martin, please proceed. Good to have you. Welcome. Uh, thanks very much, Wynn. Uh, it's always a privilege to speak for the Middle East Forum, and I'm, I'm grateful that you've remembered my book after all these years. Um, in, in the public eye, intellectuals are uh, forever remembered for the controversies that they generate. And when I, when I die, I suspect the headline will go something like, uh, something like this, Martin Kramer, Mideast Studies Critic, Dead at 120. <laughs> um, Nothing I've written or will write, uh, nothing I've done or will do uh, can change that. Uh, the explanation is 9-11. I wrote uh, Ivory Towers on Sand before 9-11. And if 9-11 hadn't happened, it would have remained, I think, one more item on my publication list. Uh, but 9-11 uh, turbocharged it. Uh, and here were some of the headlines. I went back uh, to check them. Uh, the New York Times, uh, experts on Islam pointing fingers at one another. Uh, the Washington Post, Mideast studies professors get failing grade. Uh, foreign affairs, who lost Middle Eastern studies. Uh, Salon.com, Osama University, question mark. A, uh, a reviewer in the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, called the book a cluster bomb. And the New Republic reported uh, that in that fall's conference of the Middle East Studies Association, my name was booed when mentioned in the plenary session. Um, now, uh, I, I have no complaint. Uh, it's a controversy I invited, not one imposed on me, uh, but I didn't expect this sort of impact. I wrote the book uh, thinking only academics would take an interest and read it. Instead, it, it became part of a much bigger and heated discussion over uh, what made the United States vulnerable on 9-11. Uh, the main line of the argument in the book was that Middle Eastern studies in America had consistently missed the most important developments in the region. Uh, one of them was the rise of very radical forms of Islamist extremism. Uh, and that claim by me is why the book uh, took off. And let me be clear, uh, I didn't argue that academics or anyone else could or should have uh, predicted 9-11. Uh, let's admit it, even, uh, even the greatest experts can't predict such things. Uh, allow me to quote uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, it is not given to human beings uh, to foresee or to predict to any large extent the unfolding course of events, uh, end of quote. And in fact, nearly all the events that have transformed the Middle East since I started to study it uh, were surprises. The October 1973 war, uh, Sadat's visit to Jerusalem, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, uh, the Iranian revolution, the Iraqi invasion, of Kuwait, 9-11, and, and the Arab Spring. I did show that when events failed to conform to academic models, the academics disregarded or distorted the evidence. And still worse, uh, they poured scorn on anyone who dared to propose another way forward. Um, every intellectual endeavor uh, to stay credible has to correct itself. And this was the problem, not that Middle Eastern studies got some big things wrong, but that they wouldn't acknowledge it and then revisit their assumptions. And that's actually, I think, the greater sin. Uh, but I haven't been asked to discuss what went before 9-11. You want to know what's happened since and what's happening now. 
The first thing I'd say is that the market share of academics in interpreting the Middle East for Americans is now much smaller than it was uh, just after 9-11. Up till then, uh, studying the Middle East and writing about it were very much a, a niche industry. Uh, the lead producers were university-based academics and a few specialized think tanks. Uh, if you were smart, if you were ambitious, and you didn't have a dog in some uh, Middle Eastern fight, uh, you specialized on something else. Uh, sure, the Middle East erupted every so often, but it didn't stay on the front burner or on the front pages for, for very long. Right after 9-11, America demanded to know why they hate us and how do we change them. Um, at the time, the academic experts were swamped with invites from TV producers, newspaper editors, and senior officials. And they uh, performed unevenly, to say the least. Uh, and that's because academics tended to sound one repetitive note. America is to blame. And that wasn't so much an analysis, it's just a profession of, of faith. Uh, but very quickly, the whole ecosystem changed. Uh, the main effect of 9-11 was to make the Middle East a matter of very wide concern. And that meant that smart people who hadn't given the Middle East much thought made themselves into experts, and some did so quite, quite credibly. Not only did the region-specific think tanks grow, but the bigger general think tanks built out large shops to deal with the Middle East. And these alternative experts drove the academics out of the limelight fairly quickly. Uh, generally, the alternative voices ignored the Blame America narrative and they searched for deeper, deeper causes. And they discovered, I think, a whole world of, of rage and grievance that the academics had overlooked. I think especially impressive was the way uh, top journalists rode 9-11 to become some of America's leading interpreters of the Middle East. Uh, there is today a very large shelf of books about Al-Qaeda, Bin Laden, Afghanistan, Iraq, Islamism, the Arab Spring, written by journalists. Uh, many made the bestseller lists and, and won prizes. Uh, then there were the, uh, the military officers, uh, the diplomats, the officials who served on front lines from, from Afghanistan to Iraq to Syria. Uh, before 9-11, before few of them had much on the ground experience in the region. Uh, they took an over the horizon view, uh, but the war cycled several million Americans through the Middle East. Uh, and many of these people developed a very high resolution knowledge of politics and society and culture. Uh, so if you look today at the people summoned to comment on the region, the proportion of them uh, who had their boots on the ground is very high. And I think it's likely to stay that way uh, for years to come. So in sum, very little of what the public reads or hears about the Middle East today comes from academics. And uh, you can see that in the 9-11 documentaries uh, that have been broadcast in the general media uh, on this 20th anniversary uh, among, among the quotable talking heads. Academics are almost entirely absent. Uh, so they mostly write and speak for each other in a, in a narrow circle uh, or for the slightly wider circle of the farther, the farther left. Now, if you want more proof, you know, ask yourself this. Does anyone in the field, any credentialed professor of Middle Eastern studies enjoy any broad name recognition in America? Uh, I think the answer is an obvious no. Uh, the last one was uh, the late Bernard Lewis, my mentor. Lewis had two New York Times bestsellers right after 9-11, What Went Wrong and, uh, and The Crisis of Islam. They were quick, readable syntheses that filled an immediate void, and they literally flew off, off the shelves. But Lewis, um, well, and to some extent also Fuad Ajami, uh, were the except exceptions that proved uh, the rule. And the rule is this, academic study of the Middle East doesn't produce high profile public intellectuals. So if I were to update my book about the failings of Middle Eastern studies today, I mean, who would care? America hasn't looked to academics for its ideas about the region in a long, in a long while. Uh, and yet Middle Eastern studies still matter, uh, not because of what academics say or write, uh, but because of what they teach. Uh, the most most prestigious universities, how shall I put it, 
They're no longer the beacons on a hill that they once were, uh, but their degrees are still coveted. You know, I still get mileage from my Princeton degrees, just as a Daniel Pipe still gets mileage from Harvard's. Um, these are you know, the most durable brands in America, uh, some predating American independence. Uh, so it's not surprising that young people still compete sometimes ferociously uh, to get into these places. And, and, and from there, they'll go on to make policy and form opinion and command America's power in the world. Um, and my guess is that the indoctrination is as bad as ever. Now I say guess because the classroom isn't public domain, uh, but if academics teach in the classroom what they say and write for the public domain, then, then it's still a closed circle. Uh, back around 9-11, I, I still felt there were maybe half a dozen universities where a student could find enough balance to get a credential worth having. Uh, today, um, I, I wouldn't need all the fingers of one, of one hand. So uh, what's to be done? Well, I used to think that the government uh, could balance things in institutions subsidized by the taxpayer, uh, such as university Middle East centers. Well, I doubt it now. Uh, higher ed has an effective lobby in Washington and the White House and Congress don't care much because you know, in, in relative terms, the money is quite small. Uh, so yes, by all means, let's have accountability for biased outreach programs and let's have universities disclose uh, foreign funding as required by law. Um, but let's not delude ourselves because this won't make uh, much of a dent. What does seem to work, at least in certain cases, is shaming. Uh, of course, much of academia is shameless, and in those places, uh, the game is long lost, um, and I won't name the universities. But even in this era of rampant wokeness, uh, there are university administrations that care about quality. So calling out uh, error and bias in these settings has some value. Uh, kudos to Campus Watch for doing this. Uh, it's not gonna reverse the trend, it's not gonna stop it, but it might slow it down. Uh, but criticism can only do so much. Just, just as important is creating alternatives. Uh, for example, on the disciplinary level, there's the alternative uh, to the Middle East Studies Association. Uh, it's known as the Association for the Study of the Middle East and Africa, or ASMIA. I'm pleased to be on its board. Uh, the Middle East Quarterly, of the Middle East Forum, uh, and I once had the privilege of editing that journal, uh, also makes room for dissenting views. Uh, in the field of international relations, including the Middle East, there's the uh, Alexander Hamilton Society. Um, and there are a few initiatives at the level of individual American institutions, uh, which, I, which I won't name. Uh, creating alternatives is labor intensive because it involves swimming against the prevailing currents in, in academia. Uh, success requires cunning and tact and money. Um, and there's no package formula because every campus is a planet unto itself and what flies on one wheel will crash on another. Um, but I think it's the only way left open. We're not going to see a revolution in Middle Eastern studies. Uh, a generation or more will have to die out uh, before that has a chance of happening. Uh, the objective must be, I think, more modest to create some space for alternative views and free debate on the Middle East. Um, to some extent, that has been achieved over the past 20 years. I think the challenge for the next 20 years is to enlarge that space and, and then to fill it. And so when, uh, I'll conclude there. Can't hear you. Sorry, sorry, now I'm Nanda. Uh, thank you for those, for those stimulating comments. They, 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 um, Several things occurred to me as you were as you were speaking. Um, one of which was the the drop in influence by what we might call star Middle East studies professors. Where are the Bernard Lewis's of, of today? Um, and you mentioned journalists and other commentators uh, to some degree filling these shoes. I guess my my question would be: uh, Has anyone really filled those shoes? I mean, the, is the quality of information that is available to the public today? regarding the Middle East, 
comparable to the, what it was, whatever the source, whether it's journalists uh, who disagree with the Middle East studies uh, status quo or the professors themselves, uh, has it increased or decreased over the past 20, 25 years, do you think? Well, my overall impression is that it has probably increased, increased in terms of firsthand familiarity with the situation on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because you know, hundreds of people were sent out to cover these things. Um, and they were also sent out to cover things that the Middle East academics couldn't cover. And that even people like Bernard Lewis couldn't access. For example, prior to 9-11, the bookshelf on Saudi Arabia was virtually empty. There was nothing there. Academics didn't work on it, either because they couldn't get access or they were af afraid that if they got some access and wrote something uncomplimentary about Saudi Arabia, it would forever uh, uh, block their universities from ever getting any, any funds right. Right. from uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, then the journalists after 9-11 began to pick up the story and now we have a very impressive um, accounting of uh, Islamic extremism in Saudi Arabia, uh, some of the leading actors in uh, the Saudi royal house, all of this is now, is a work of journalists basically, uh, prying in, 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 into secret space. Um, and so I think there we've got you know, a pretty Im Im impressive array. Those journalists in the past wouldn't have bothered with the Middle East just wasn't big enough story. Remember when you're a journalist, when you're a journalist, the main thing is to get on the bestseller list and to get your stories on page one. And the Middle East didn't provide that. It has provided that for the better part of 20 years now. So just in sheer numbers of people, I mean, there's just many more people doing this than there were before 9-11. So I'd say, yeah, there's more out there. There's and, and, if you, and you were asking a question really in absolute terms as to quantity, there's much more out there. What it may not, have and what the likes of Bernard Lewis and Fuad Ajami provided is the longer historical perspective. Um, that was something that could only be done by academic historians and uh, no one is doing it for a wider public today. So we get a lot of reportage of a very high quality. We haven't had sort of a major book uh, or even a major article in some place like the Atlantic or the New Yorker or you know, putting things in the broader historical perspective um, the way it had been done in the past. So we're getting more views, um, some of them perhaps less radical than what would be available were professors the only source of information on this. But as you say, they, they necessarily lack the depth, the, the intellectual depth, the um, historiographical knowledge that would come from years of study um, even if they do make up for that in some ways by many people having lived there or been there because of the wars. Um, we have a question from uh, Carrie Hillebrand, one of our viewers, who says, to what practical extent does foreign funding, particularly but not exclusively from Saudi Arabia, uh, impact on the agenda of Middle East studies? And I would add also from um, the rest of the Gulf uh, region there. Do, do, you know, at one point, um, 20, 25 years ago, that was that was all the rage was the big uh, donations coming in from Saudi Arabia. Um, <clears throat> do they play the same role that they, did, that they once did? I mean, what, what's your view on the overall foreign funding in uh, Middle East studies and in higher education generally, if you wish to go beyond that? Right. Um, excellent question. Um, there is still some money coming in. Um, but I think the more, the more interesting aspect of this, um, this nexus of money coming mostly from the Gulf and the universities isn't so much in the field of Middle Eastern studies in particular, but these satellite campuses that have been created in some of the Gulf states, uh, joint programs, hospitals being built, all sorts of things that are going on and which represent partnerships between American universities and, um, and, and Gulf states. Now, I want it to be absolutely clear. I think that many Gulf states uh, play a positive role overall in Middle Eastern politics. Um, Abraham Accords represents a, a signal breakthrough. Um, but I'm always wary of uh, partnerships between institutions which pride themselves on uh, promoting um, the pursuit of truth and the free and open exchange of ideas 
and governments which, for, for, for which these things are anathema, <clears throat> certainly not priorities. Mm. Now, if you're sitting in a Middle East studies department in one of these universities, which is avidly pursuing a relationship with uh, a moneyed uh, Middle Eastern state, uh, you're likely to pull your punches. Um, and one effect of that is not so much to create you know, scholarship which is sympathetic to these countries, but just to take those the study of those countries off the agenda. You know, no one who wants to advance a career in academia is going to focus on, on these countries because the, their deans and provosts might look askance at it. Uh, and um, that's and so, and so you get these sort of black holes of research, which no one uh, ventures to fill. Um, and um, and uh, I think that's the, and not necessarily because money is coming into Middle Eastern studies, but because in the bigger picture, these universities are internationalizing in such a way as to, um, to create a, a relationship of dependency uh, with, uh, with so, so certain governments. Obviously, and again, it's the non-academics who've managed to keep up our understanding of these, of what goes on in these black holes, these academic black holes, and to fill the gap. Um, but I don't think that's gonna change anytime soon. The, the general trend of American institutions of higher education is to, is to look abroad for expansion. Um, that I think is gonna become even more uh, significant in the COVID era. Uh, as education moves increasingly to an online format also, um, they're gonna be looking more and more for, uh, for potential uh, student bodies and, um, and partnerships internationally. Um, and so um, we're just gonna to have to, to, to live with the fact that uh, the, uh, the flow of foreign money is a, is, 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 a, is a force that constricts the range of study of the Middle East in the American Academy. Thank you. Excellent. We have a question from an anonymous attendee who says, um, would you say that Middle East studies is driven mainly by liberal thinking Arabists, less than sympathetic to the goals of the state of Israel, or has that tide largely turned? I will take the liberty of expanding that and asking you the, the role of Arabists these days. It's an old term. Uh, it's been around a long time. We think of um, Protestant missionaries in Lebanon, uh, you know, in the 19th century, and forward coming coming forward from that, um, is that still a viable school of, of thought uh, within um, Middle East studies, um, or and how does that have an effect on their view of the existence of Israel? Well, the liberal Arabists pushed out of Middle Eastern studies a while ago. Um, perhaps the most famous was Malcolm Kerr from UCLA later president of the American University of Beirut, where he was um, assassinated later. Um, he wrote the main critique of Edward Said's Orientalism in the International Journal for Middle Eastern Studies. Um, there was a, still some degree of fair-mindedness about the liberal Arabists. They had their biases and prejudices. Uh, they regretted the creation of Israel, no question about that. Uh, uh, but they understood that at some level it had to be uh, accommodated, uh, provided it made the necessary concessions to the Arabs and to the Palestinians specifically in the framework of a peace agreement. Uh, that was the position of the liberal Arabists. But they were pushed aside long ago. Uh, and people who determine the pace of Middle Eastern studies today are actually more, much more radical. Uh, they tend to be radical leftists um, who fought tooth and nail for their academic positions um, in, the, uh, in the 80s and 90s. They became a kind of counter-establishment, which is now dominant in, in the field. And their position isn't to find ways in which the Arab world can come to an accommodation with Israel, but to completely delegitimize Israel. Uh, they lend their support to the BDS, the One State Solution, and so forth. So um, there is something, uh, a whiff of, of nostalgia about this notion that the, you know, uh, the liberal Arabists pose a problem. If only there were still some liberal Arabists <laughs> around, we could probably have a meaningful dialogue with them. Uh, but instead we're stuck with, uh, with radicals, many of them who were themselves 
come from radical politics within the Middle East and have um, trans basically transformed Middle East Studies Association into a kind of lobby, uh, which resembles nothing so much as, um, as a union of academics and some benighted um, dictatorship in the Middle East. That, that was going to be one of my next questions to you, Martin, to segue into that. You had you have over the years mentioned and noted the um, the increase in sheer percentage of Middle East studies professors whose origins are in the Middle East, not simply ancestry, but who were themselves born there and who have come to the United States um, to work. Uh, <clears throat> do you see that trend continuing? You mentioned just now some of the effects of it, and please feel free to comment on more of that if you would like. But do, are we going to continue to import faculty at the, uh, the rate we have over the past 20 or 30 years, do you think? I don't know. Um, it's, it's almost a numerical question, and I don't have the, statist the statistical basis on which to answer that. I would say, by the way, that, um, um, that as a general matter of principle, it's people coming from the Middle East to teach in American universities could be a, a huge asset. I mentioned earlier Ford sure. Algemi. Mm -hmm. He was one of my teachers as an undergraduate and one of my mentors and a close friend. And if you go on the internet, you'll find many of my tributes to uh, Professor Ajami. He was, mm -hmm. uh, he was a major addition to, um, uh, to our understanding of the Middle East. Um, there's a, there, there, there is potentially huge value there. The problem is that when people bring with them in their baggage, uh, the very same commitments that, um, um, that, that in which, to which they were indoctrinated in their country of origin. Uh, Fuad was a good example. He was, um, he was indoctrinated as a Nasserist, as a young man. And through his long interaction with American values, American mores, American politics, and Americans, um, he had a change of heart. Um, so it's really a question of acculturation. Uh, we want an amalgam of people with regional knowledge that can sometimes comes, sometimes can't be surpassed when it comes from individuals who come from the region, but who are acculturated to the values that America generally shares, which is openness, tolerance, free exchange of ideas, and, uh, and a willingness to correct course. Uh, and that's the problem. It's people who are not prepared to do that because, for, um, because they have they, they remain embedded, as it were, in, uh, in one culture and have not succeeded in acculturating to, um, uh, to the norms which, um, which make intellectual life in America tolerable. Sure, sure. You have written that when you uh, received your PhD in 1981, um, so grim was the situation then in hiring historians uh, from your, with your viewpoint that you didn't bother uh, applying for jobs in the United States is how you, what are the ways you landed in, in Tel Aviv? Um, and the, the couple of minutes we have remaining, um, the, what has happened in the, that's 40 years ago now. So not only 20 years ago, <laughs> I, I, was, I was in college then too, but not only 20 years ago, but, but 40. Um, it doesn't seem to be getting any better in hiring. The gates are still controlled by the people who, uh, or at least of similar mind, or at least uh, uh, equally hostile to someone with your viewpoint as they were when you were coming out of Princeton. Um, do you agree with that? And, and what can we do? Is, what, can anything be done about uh, the um, ideological homogeneity that rules Middle Eastern studies and so much of academia? I hate to end on a pessimistic note. I mean, okay, like, okay, well, well, prove me wrong then, that's all right. Let me put it this way. I mean, I, I have a hard time even getting invited to to speak on campuses today, forget about, <laughs> forget about an academic appointment on an American campus. Although I, I have been visiting professor here and there over the past 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I come back to the point I made in my remarks, creating alternatives. Um, I didn't wanna mention, and I won't mention specific institutions, but here and there you see, I'd say shoots coming up from the ground of things which have the potential to create um, uh, to create alternatives, even within an academic setting. And remember, um, while say, the top tier institutions, the, the, the list is the same as it was when I was a, a graduate student. Once you get down to second tier and third tier, there's a, 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 lot, of, a lot of room for entrepreneurial 
institutions to make uh, to make a mark and to create you know, opportunity. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I said earlier, no one can make predictions about the Middle East. I don't think anyone can make predictions about Middle Eastern studies and be sure that and be absolutely confident that they'll uh, they'll um, uh, they'll um, come to pass. So, I'll just end on the optimistic note that I'd like to Good. end. Yeah. On. And, uh, and uh, say that hopefully when we reconvene, uh, you and I in another 20 years to review the 40 year anniversary, <laughs> I'll be able to report on, um, on more progress and you'll be able to report that you have uh, over Campus Watch um, less issues of concern than, than you have today. That would be wonderful be, uh, for, for many reasons, I would have that. Um, Last question, uh, how can our viewers who would like to read your writings, keep up with your thoughts, uh, find you on the web? Very easy. Just go to uh, www.martinkramer.org. Uh, you can search for articles and books. You can download Ivory Towers on Sand, which is readily available. And you can also subscribe and get uh, my mailings of my, my latest uh, news directly. Highly recommended uh, for those who do it. Martin, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, I know on behalf of our audience, we've learned a great deal from you and we appreciate it tremendously. Thank you so much for joining us today. And to all of our viewers and listeners, um, thank you for joining us. Hope you have a very pleasant day and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you, Wynn. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for your work. Thank you.